Let's embark on the Ark Republic to hear current news that's published. More than gossip and chatter, covering current affairs that matter. We talk issues with professional views, all keeping you in queue. We wanted a higher vibe for these days and times to free the voices and minds. Reporting the sign of the times so all can build. Let's shine. Yeah. We talked about the internal conflicts of Iran. Now we're talking about these internal conflicts of Israel, but how the Israel-Palestine situation has popped up or leaked into the U.S. in a way that we're seeing like what happens in 1970s, right? Late 60s, 1970s with the Vietnam War. We are seeing across the U.S. Um, at campuses, and, and, and not all campuses, but certain campuses, this uh, protest in terms of calls for ceasefires. Well, you you have actually um, different different sides of of the issue. Uh, and so, what are your thoughts on that? You having worked at universities, what is this saying about where we are in the world today? Well, when we when we talk about so first off, I think it is, it is abhorrent that we are calling police to peaceful protest. These students are peacefully protesting. And in many ways, I think that we are sending the wrong signal to the world if we really say that we believe in democracy. So that's number one. Number two, the places that we see a lot of this uh, protest popping up are, are at institutions who are, that are vested with Israel, is with Israel, and what I mean by that, there's Israeli money, right? Whether it be Jewish money that's that stateside or Jewish money that is across the water, um, being being leveraged at these institutions, and that's where I think that you're starting to see, or that's where you see the most protests are in in these or in these spots uh, at these institutions where then there is this level of investment or these these investment dollars. Um, that that are that are primarily Jewish, right? And that Palestinians or that those that are sympathetic to the pal to the, to the Palestinian plight, i.e., Black people, um, are then saying are are standing in solidarity in many ways um, with Palestinians that are then protesting about the about the care. And one of the things that I think that uh, we have to be very clear here is that protests are not anti-Semitic. Right, that protesting against what is happening is not anti-Semitic, but we are seeing in many ways that it being weaponized as such uh, that then justifies then this use of force that I think is problematic. I think the I think the third thing that we have to think about is, is that in a melting pot that is the United States, why did we not think we were going to see these levels of protest? Right, you cannot in many ways celebrate diversity and then be mad when conflict arises because of said diversity. That is then the nature of having a having diversity at large. That is why I think in many in many uh, many ways that when we're talking about diversity, we are so concerned or so consumed with race, which wasn't a construct is a construct that is that is loosely constructed in the 1500s, right? But in actuality, diversity is really about ethnicity and experiences and how ethnicity then plays into experiences that then deals with culture that then um, informs values. And I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing young people remind us here in these United States what we say our values are and how we live up to them. And I think that without these young people that must continuously push us, especially as older folks that get far more comfortable, that must continuously push us to remind us that if we are going to be a country of immigrants, that we have to give voice and allow space for all said immigrants to then um, speak up and speak out against injustice. Yes, young folks are definitely our litmus test in terms of how we're going to move this thing called democracy forward. 
Uh, this is a fun fact for those of you who are protesting. When a black media person comes and uh, asks you a question, answer the question. We are not the ops. That's just a, the, the side note because I see some very interesting things playing out in some of these um, at these at, at these encampments in terms of who they'll talk to and who they who they will not talk to. But that's another conversation for another day. Last question on this: If you were an administrator at one of these high activity universities where the protests are es not the protests, but the but it has escalated to um, local law enforcement being called and these arrests of students and as well as faculty. Uh, what do you think would, should be the best course of action if you were in a leadership role? Because I think a lot of these folk in leadership roles need to hear, need to have another perspective. Stop calling the police. It's just that, I mean, we're making this very complex, Taiya, like it's difficult. We already know that violence, that, that, that violence then, that violence only ensues once we call the police. I, I mean, we're making this difficult. It's not that difficult. Stop calling the police. That's number one. Number one, stop calling the police. Number two, administrators, get out of your offices, get down on the ground and go talk to these students because that is what education is about. It's about engaging them where they are. And if they're on your lawn hollering, then go engage them. Go have conversations. They have these these students are very organized. They have leadership. They have they 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 are coordinating coming to class, not coming to class. They have a, a, a system that they've established. Administrators, number one, stop calling the police. You have campus police. Use the campus police. That's number one. Number two, uh, come out of your office and have conversations with these students. And number three, be prepared to go back to the administration and say, here are the demands. What are we going to do then based upon these are the demands? What I see a lot of times or what I'm seeing a lot of, even from a good colleague of mine who's the president, who was the past, who's the immediate past president of the National Coalition of Black Political Scientists, who was arrested at the University of California, Irvine last week, what I'm seeing is this level of brutality because administrators are scared about losing their jobs. If you're scared about losing your job, don't take a job in administration in the collegiate at atmosphere. The job of president, the job of administrator in collegiate uh, in the collegiate space has drastically changed in the last five to ten years. If you don't want to deal with conflict, if you don't want, if you want a cushy, nice job, then do not get in administration. These jobs are messy. They're difficult and they're going to require not only people that have great strategic skills, but it's also going to take a level of empathy. It's also going to take the ability to listen to these young people. And that is the largest thing that I see not happening. I've not seen one administrator in any of these protests or any of the coverage that I've seen in mainstream media. I don't see any administrators down in the encampments, having conversations with these students. That these are good points that you're making. What is the difference between the protest of Israel-Palestine versus the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw several years ago? Oh, I mean, there's huge differences, right? And there are huge differences because the Palestinian, the Palestinian protests uh, against the this this Hamas Palestinian Israel conflict is really about us espousing our values, but us espousing our values that's directly then tied to foreign aid and money, right? Whereas the Black Lives Matter issue is far more of a local issue because it's really about the how the police is then treating people locally. It is connected to the federal government because the federal government plays a role in who they send money to in these in these uh, in these policing uh, municipalities. But it's very different because we're not talking when we're talking about the police locally. We are talking about the state, meaning not the United States of America. But we're talking about, about a particular state, Missouri, Minnesota, Alabama, Georgia. And so to me, the Black Lives Matter is very different because it's a holistic conversation about the state, little state versus the state, big state. And then where do Black people then situate themselves about getting what they best need um, from a from a from a country largely that has that has that has not lived up to its values and what they say that, that they espouse. 
Whereas when we're talking about Palestine, Hamas, Israel, we're talking about big state, United States, and we're talking about its participation uh, on the international stage in how it's postured amongst its foreign policy. And you know, I, I, I we've been having this conversation about like what the differences are. Now, of course, there's been waves of Black Lives Matter protests over the years, but I would say the height is the post George Floyd or with the George Floyd moment. And I say, well, one of the things is, is that everybody was quarantined. So you didn't have traditional school. So you had a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands to at the very least reflect and be in conversation about what's wrong with America and how, what we really need to do to move forward. I think that is important. But also these students who are protesting are the quarantine babies that probably either participated or were in these protests or saw uh, somebody in their family having the conversation, whatever side they were on. So now four years later, right? I cannot believe it's been four years, right? You know, four years later, uh, it's this challenging what you said. Are you U.S. government who you say you are, right? So it really is another type of test in terms of d democracy and how we see it. And I like how you said this is like an international, this is an international conversation um, with, with what we see. But we have to also keep this in the framework. These are our quarantine babies in 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 the George Floyd moment that saw their parents or their whatever protesting, and they're using their agency to do so, right? My question with what you were talking about, how the leadership needs to reorient itself and and and, and, and get more um, uh, spine in terms of how they're gonna address it or be prepared to be fired or step down if necessary, if they have a stance. I wanna know how do, to, do these responses or the anxiety or the trepidation that you see amongst university leaders that you say has everything to do with how universities are funded nowadays. Oh my gosh, Kaya, you, so I, I so first off, let me say, uh, I'm only HBCU educated and white folks don't know how to be broke. So that plays into a huge that, that plays hugely into this. They don't know how to be broke. They kill themselves. They, they, you know, they, they don't know how to be broke. Like they're, they're, they're not having resources puts them in a tailspin in a way that it just doesn't other groups of people, right? So I think that plays a huge role in the funding piece, right? Because we've seen divestment from higher education really for the last 30 years. We've seen divestment at the at the state level in particular, right? Um, and so, and, and 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 I'm talking about big schools. I'm talking about Texas A&M. I'm talking about Florida State. I'm talking about the University of Florida. I'm talking about the University of North Carolina, right? We're we're I'm talking about uh, flagship institutions inside states that are seeing this divestment in higher education. And as we say in the Black community, if if white folks, uh, if white folks catch a cold, we get pneumonia, right? So there's a there's that trickle down then effect for that divestment um, from it for MSIs and HBCUs. So that I think the the larger divestment conversation is one that I don't want to dip into. But the second thing is because of said divestment, there is now this dependency on um, on 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 dollars that come from outside of the state apparatus. Uh, and and those dollars are typically by donors that have very specific interests. And because white folks don't know how to be broke, they they would prefer to pander to some of those interests to then remain those dollars coming in the door. And my position on all of that is, I mean, so what if they stop giving you the money? They're just gonna be heavily taxed on it anyway. I mean, the money gotta go somewhere. It's not it's not gonna be absolved. So then the question really becomes. Are you going to allow them saying they're not going to they're not going to give you this 50 million this year? Let me say it this way. What is 50 million to to Harvard who has a a, a 30 a 30 billion dollar endowment? What's 50 million? Right. A lot of these a lot of these organiz a, a lot of these institutions that are very nervous about that level of uh, of that that private donor money evaporating are institutions that are bankrolled anyway. 
and you're so scared about the about losing the power of what it means to be bankrolled and losing the ability to tell somebody where to stick it and where to get off the interstate that you're willing then in many ways to sell your soul. And my whole question is, is how much is too much money? What you, you, you're so worried about being broke. There are smaller institutions, white, particularly closing up left and right. So when we're having this conversation, it's just, it's just, it's baffling to me because rich people still need tax shelters and education is the best tax shelter for rich people to put their money into. And if, a group of you say, if you don't change your stance, you don't have to worry about giving us a dime. I bet you the folks that need the tax break will change their minds. But this goes back to some years ago when it comes out that you have something like the Koch brothers, right? Putting money in institutions to drive specific agendas. So it's, you know, so this money that we're talking about is connected to an expectation, right? To have a certain perspective. And the Koch brothers just didn't give money to white institutions, they were giving money to Hampton, uh, which is a you know a, one of the oldest HBCUs that still exists as well. So I, I I think me coming from I just came from West Virginia. Let me tell you, I saw some very impoverished white folk uh, in in the Appalachians, uh, and what I discovered is is that those folk are left way behind. If you can't use your positioning. You you will be left left behind and in the weeds. But um, I want to wrap this this portion up to talk about um, in terms of student protest. Do you think we're going to see more protests, and how do you think this is going to play out? I don't know if we're going to see more. I don't know if we're going to see more protests. And the reason I don't know if we're going to see more protests uh, is because we're, we're we're bleeding into the summer. Uh, and unless there is some, and, and let me say it to you this way, because the United, because the Biden administration is doing such a good job of talking off both sides of its mouth right now, I don't know if we're going to see, and unless there's some, unless there's some cataclysmic event that happens, I don't see it happening. The idea right now, um, Israel's not doing too well as far as getting the rocket, right? So and unless we see, unless we see another cataclysmic event, I don't see the protests ramping up. I see them actually coming down. The question then I have immediately is the same students that were out there protesting, how do we get them to actualize their voting power as far as how to get some folks out of these seats, not just the presidency, because everybody's so focused on the presidency. How do we actualize them to get people out there that are taking money from people that are then become beholden? And what I mean by that is this, and I'll give you a good example of what I mean. Angela also Brooks, who is trying to become the first black woman to become senator in the state of Maryland, really did it on $3 million, $3, 4000000 million, okay? The white boy she was running against bankrolled herself and spent $60 million, okay? She did it with three or four million. So it's not that it can't be done. The and, and, and why does she only have three or four million? Because she wouldn't take money from certain people. And what I'm saying is, Kaia, there are still politicians out there that are like that. The problem is we do not go out and support those kinds. We go, we either say, hey, we throw our hands up, say there's not much we could do, or we fall in line or we get distracted by other things that are going on. It is possible, right? Which is why in many ways they don't want us activated because if we're activated, this is the next thing in the House of Representatives. People are voted out and in every two years. If you don't like a, then you can vote that right on out of it. And I'm going to leave the, the, the bleeps and the blanks where they are. And so th that is why our democracy is dangerous. That is why the Koch brothers and those that have a, 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 a large amount of money to throw around, that's why they spend so much money because they know, they understand that we do have power if we decide to use it. And to me, Angela also Brooks is our is our example of it could be done. I'm not gonna take money from this person, this person, this person, and I'm not gonna name those people, but I'm not gonna take money from these people because the expectation is gonna be that then I'm gonna be beholden to them and I'd rather lose than be beholden. And the problem is, Kaia, we don't have enough people that are willing to lose than be then be beholden or be broke for that matter. Thank you so <laughs> thank you so much for ending this segment talking about uh, all things global stability and instability. Thank you.